everybody. Hope uh, third lockdown's going well for everybody. Homeschooling's not too much of a chore. Um, when recording the, uh, the How to Build a Buy to Let Property Empire video series, there was seven parts to it. Uh, I made several um, uh, references in there to, you know, you can ask a question and we'll, we'll answer it. So we've still got those questions coming in. Just in case you haven't seen that series, Head up, I'll, I'll put the links in the description. Go to the go to the description. Um, there's a link in there. It will take you to the forthelandlords.com website. Put your details in there, and you will be forwarded the how to build a buy to let property empire mini series, a series of videos explaining that. Um, and there's always on our website a place where you can ask a question. So the questions are still coming in. I've got a question to answer here. Um, if you could also subscribe to this video uh, YouTube channel and also like this video, that would help us out and it will keep the, the videos coming through as well. So on to today's business. Um, is it better to buy freehold or leasehold properties? Is a question we've been asked literally dozens of times now. Uh, I probably should have got round to it a little bit sooner than I have, but it just seemed to be videos that always jump the queue in terms of priority for it. But um, I think that instinctively people know or think that freehold is better than leasehold. Um, some people can't find the freehold properties at the right prices where they live. So what they're really asking is, you know, what, what, are they, um, what are the disadvantages to a freehold? Um, th there's, some, th there's for sure some advantages to, to owning a simple lock-up, new build or relatively modern um, leasehold flat. You know, they're easy to maintain and look after and there's demand for them. Um, personally, I think that freehold is better and I'll explain why. First of all, I guess, you know, what's the difference? And I'll give you the layman's guide. Uh, if you want the detailed guide, you need to be asking your solicitor or getting, uh, getting legal advice. Um, with a freehold property, you own the property uh, and the ground underneath it. Um, there might be some caveats to that because actually um, there are sometimes covenants um, or restrictions on a property, you know, what you can do to develop it, or maybe you don't own the land underneath it. Example, you know, I, I own quite a few properties where the Duke of Rutland owns the mining and mineral rights underneath the property. It's not a big deal to me. I'm not going into the mining business. And even if I did, I know they have the square patch underneath the houses that I own to do go into it in. So not a big deal, but you do need to know about these things. Um, so yeah, practically speaking, um, those kind of restrictions on a, on a freehold property, they're not going to bother you, but you do, do need to know about them. And they'll come out in the conveyancing process, of course. Um, but it's also worth noting that a freehold property, you know, often thought of as the, the most simple, the most straightforward kind of property holding, sometimes actually can be quite complicated. Um, and yeah, when you're looking at the freeholds equally, that can actually be quite simple. So, you know, there's a bit of a crossover there. Don't just think freehold easy. You do need to look into those things and particularly look at the, the quality of the title. That's what your conveyancing solicitor will do for you. Uh, with a leasehold property, you effectively rent the property for a period of time. And usually it's um, it's called a, a long period of time, so 99 years or 125 years as a starting point is quite typical. When the property lease, when the lease length comes down below, there's different numbers for different lenders, 85, 80, 75 years left on the lease, um, the property might struggle to get a mortgage, so just be aware of that. There is usually, almost always in fact, uh, provision in the lease to be able to extend it for a fee and the fee sometimes isn't much at all sometimes it's a lot again you get to find out what that is by reading through or having your solicitor read through the the leasehold pack when you're conveying it so um yeah typically you know a developer buys some land builds some flats on them and then sells you the long leasehold of that flat and for the privilege you are then going to be bound to pay a um, a ground rent, it's called. Now, the ground rent, the leasehold ground rent, can be very small, can be tiny, it can be a peppercorn. It could be £10 a year. Um, typically, for a new build block of flats, um, I've seen mostly 80 to £100, and then sometimes 150 ish for the kind of properties that we buy in our, our area. However, I have seen um, 
prices, uh, those sort of £100 levels double, you know, go up you know, in, in certain situations in, in, in our area. And in other areas, I've seen you know, thousands of, of, of pounds a month, you know, if you're talking about a very high-end flat in, in London, for example, which we wouldn't buy, but I know they exist. And you know, So they, they can be very variable. Key thing is, it's written down. You can tell what it is on the uh, conveyance. Um, there is another charge separate to the ground rent that most leasehold properties will have, and that is the service charge. And this is to cover things like um, maintaining the property, you know, repairing the roof, keep, keeping all the gutters flowing, maybe cutting the grass, cleaning the windows, those kind of things. Um, and it's not, sim it's not that simple fact that there's an extra cost that's going to put me off buying the freeholds. I mean, if we look down the list of costs, and I'm, I'm happy with the costs, and it all factors in and the deal still stacks at that, then um, it, in actual fact, sometimes when there aren't the costs, that's a red flag in itself. If there isn't a management company and those essential issues aren't getting, uh, maintenance issues aren't getting dealt with, then that can be more of a problem. Um, if the management company is looking after ensuring the building, maintaining the roof, cleaning the windows, cutting the grass, it's a job that needs doing anyway. The one thing there though is, Maybe your tenant in a freehold house, maybe, definitely, would be cutting the grass and cleaning their own windows, and it just wouldn't be a charge. Um, a, a, a negative entry in the, in the you know, an entry in the negative column for, for, for leaseholds is if the managing agent is overcharging. So, um, yeah, I've, I've had situations, and we don't have many leasehold flats at all, we've moved away from completely, but yeah, the whole roof of the block needs to be replaced and it's it's hundreds of thousands it was a big block uh, and um, when you divided it into the cost per roof per flat it was you know, twelve thousand pounds odd from memory uh, and uh, that just seemed a lot of money to pay for the roof over I, I, I can change the roof on one sim and uh, one detached or sorry, um, terraced house for three thousand pounds usually so um, you know, whole house three thousand pounds flat circa 12, felt that like we were being overcharged and that was completely out of my control. So um, the fees can go up and in my um, experience they do tend to go up and you're out of control. There's an even bigger risk uh, during a, a recession or in a downturn in the market, this is bigger risk with leaseholds, um, you know, what if people stop paying that charge? You know, if the other leaseholders stop paying it or they get repossessed and then nobody pays it. The block can quickly go downhill and I've seen you know, very nice swanky blocks of flats with a you know, swimming pool in the basement and uh, fast forward five years later and people are washing their clothes in the swimming pool because it's just completely gone downhill. That's a real life story. <laughs> um, that lack of control is um, uh, one of my reasons for not liking these old properties. There's also the small stuff, you know. Uh, 10 people walking through one f communal front door going up and your tenant is one of the 10 but maybe there's two other housing flats that have been rented out and there's some antisocial behavior going on and you've got absolutely no control over that have you um the instances of antisocial behavior are higher in a block of flats than in in houses simply because people are living on top of each other um yeah the same thing can happen but perhaps to a lesser extent um, with uh, with freehold, you still get noisy neighbour complaints, but things feel a lot more in control. Um, just to be clear, you know, we've got absolutely nothing against flats per se. Uh, I own quite a few flats. Other clients of ours own flats, um, but we would try and buy the entire block. You know, if you want to buy ten houses, quite often it can be easier to buy ten flats. And if you own them all in one block, you know the block is ten ten flats strong. You buy the entire block. That can be a really good way to get the numbers up quick and um, you, you remain in control. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's why we, we prefer freeholds to leaseholds. However, if you just can't buy freeholds at the right price in, in your area where you live and you have to buy leaseholds, so long as they stack and you're aware of all of these um, costs and the potential for the costs to rise and how much you're in control of that, um, if it works for you, then uh, it might still be worth buying leasehold properties, of course, as long as you know all of those um, those factors. One thing to add in, I've got another couple of sort of points here, uh, and they're important ones. 
Uh, it's about the very long leaseholds, sometimes called virtual freehold properties, and we, we buy a lot of these. Uh, if you're buying um, in more northern parts of the UK, actually also in the, some of the southwest parts, um, they, these are very common. This is um, 999 years, most typically. Um, if you think the, the, the property almost certainly will not be standing. If it you know, this is a terraced house, it probably won't be standing in a thousand years' time will certainly be long gone. So it's virtual freehold. Um, sometimes that virtual freehold was used to reserve some of the same rights as the covenants would have reserved in a, um, a, a freeholder situation. Um, there was a thing called, a, you could Google it, a copyholder rights, but, and they were generally transferred to freeholder rights in you know, at the end of the feudal system. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes that was that. Um, more often it's, um, a factory owner built you know, several terraces and then rented those to uh, to the uh, to, to the workers and they've gradually got sold off um, and quite often you will find missing pieces of paperwork you know parchment and hasn't been copied over to the land registry those kind of things uh, maybe that factory that was thriving in the late 1700s had gone bankrupt by the mid mid 1800s and then people started to buy them separately and all the paperwork's been lost now that can cause problems for leaseholders and they can be genuine problems. Your conveyancer will check through them, but more often than not, a simple indemnity policy, that's an insurance policy that says, if the um, freeholder comes back and claims title on this property from the 1850s, I will be compensated to the value of the property. Now, put it in perspective, that, uh, that, that indemnity can be 30, 40, 50 pounds, might be 100 pounds, but you know, very cheap. Uh, and considering the, the liability, the entire cost of your property, um, the likelihood of it happening is very, very um, slim indeed. So it's definitely worth um, looking out for that. So long as you can get a mortgage on the property, you know, the title is good enough for that, uh, and it will be your conveyancing process that goes through that and lets you know that, then um, I'm, I'm good to buy those kind of properties, long, long leasehold and virtual, extra long leasehold, virtual freehold, absolutely fine. Um, one other thing, uh, leasehold houses generally made a bit of a comeback in the last decade and they've definitely got a bad name for themselves. Um, rightly so, I think. Um, and, and it's different. Typically, these will be the, uh, the same kind of leaseholds as put on flats, but put on houses. And they were done for a couple of maybe dodgy reasons. Maybe the developer just wants to keep milk in the, the, uh, the development um, and, and it's a way for them to do that. Maybe it's a genuine reason, you know, service charge and we've got some nice landscaped areas, maybe a playground in the middle of an estate and we want to have you know, 20 pounds a month from every house to pay to maintain so that that might be okay. Um, probably not in the kind of house that you want to rent out, but you know, it might be if you want to buy those. Um, sometimes it's because the development hasn't got adopted roads. So the roads aren't to a standard where they've been adopted, so they need maintaining privately. And there's a document that says there that says we're going to have X, Y, and Z company do all these jobs, and we need to collect maintenance via a service charge. Um, personally, I'd stay clear of those, and um, I think it's well documented in, in, in the news at the moment why why you'd want to stay clear of those. So. Um, yeah, I think I think we've covered off. We made a list. There was about seven or eight different ways that question was answered. And I think you know that that's got everything. If you've got any other questions, um, feel free to write in to inspire at forthelandlords.com to get your questions answered. I hope that helps. I hope, hope it was a good reference for you. Um, make sure you get full sight of all the documents. Make sure your solicitor does a good check of you know, is this a, a good enough title, particularly for a mortgage. If you're buying in cash, you need to ask the question: Can I get a mortgage after that? That could be a question for your mortgage broker. Uh, don't get put off by missing ancient documents from the 1700s and 1800s. Just look for the indemnity policy that will fix those. If there is one and it's easily available, buy it. If there's tricky questions around whether it's actually going to be mortgageable, I'd walk away from that. Don't buy that. Don't push it too far. But if it's easily answerable, move on. It's quick and easy. If it's not, find another deal. Um, and uh, as always, it's important to take proper legal advice. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, like this video, thanks very much for watching and uh, we'll speak again soon.